My name is Brian Keating. I'm on the worship staff here, and it's so good to have you this morning. I just want to start by reading a quick scripture. It's from Psalm 19, verse 14. It says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So our verse, our call to worship this morning reminds us of two things. It says, the Lord is looking for our wholehearted worship, not just words and song, but the meditation of our hearts, not just thoughts, but proclamations declaring his worthiness, words and meditation. And the second thing is that the Lord is the one who makes our offering of worship acceptable. He is our rock and redeemer. Our praise springs from what Jesus has done at the cross. His atoning sacrifice makes all of our offerings of worship acceptable. So this morning, let's come together with our words and hearts to praise our gracious, glorious, and worthy God. Would you stand with us as we proclaim that he is our king?
you may be seated. Greetings Church family, we're about to watch a mission highlight video from our recent trip to Nashua, New Hampshire, where we worked with the Lytle family, Jack and George Ann and their kids. In fact, just over two years ago, they were sitting right here at McGregor Baptist Church when the Lord called them out uh, to be missionaries up in the northeastern part of the United States. Uh, we did many activities with them throughout the week. We had some special projects with a local school. We did witnessing downtown, witnessing in the parks, praying for people, uh, helped set up the church service on Sunday morning. It was a great team from McGregor Baptist Church. I hope you enjoy the highlight video you're about to watch. Uh, we were able to pass out over 200 uh, school supply boxes, uh, which contained uh, pencils, erasers, pens, notepads, folders. Uh, we put these in the school classrooms. We prayed over them. We were able to actually pray with some of the administration uh, of the school, which is really unheard of. What a joy to be part of a church that goes to various places in various ways to share and declare the love of Jesus Christ to a world that desperately needs to hear the message of the gospel and see it demonstrated out. We praise God for that. And again, if you've not taken advantage of the opportunities that this body of Christ puts before you to go a little bit outside your, your comfortable home geography to be a part of, of spreading the love and the message of Jesus Christ, those opportunities are being put before you all the time. Take advantage of them. We gather here, however, on the Lord's Day to worship the Lord in song as one of our first purposes. We've already begun to do that together. You know, the singing of the congregation is an important, distinct value to the living God. It's not the same as listening to your favorite Christian music in the, in the car or at the house and singing along. That, that's great, that may even be important, but the, the worship of the congregation matters to God so greatly. The, the largest book in your Bible is a congregational hymnal called the Book of Psalms. It's 3,000 years old, but it's, it's still very much alive. Congregational worship matters to the Lord and it's part of why we gather. Second reason we gather is we gather to study God's Word together. I'm Pastor Russell and it'll be my joy in a few minutes to lead in the study of God's Word here. And I'm excited about doing that. And then third, we gather to be an encouragement to one another. That's important because we, we need one another. If anything, this morning's passage, 1 Corinthians 13, is about the love for one another that has to be there because we need one another so, so much. Now, if you're here this morning and you're a guest, we're really, really glad that you're here. And we've provided a, a connection card in the back of the pew there in front of you. And that card is there in case you have a question you want to ask, a prayer request you want to share, something you feel we need to know. And if you'll give us enough information on that card to be back in touch with you 
We will, and we'll look forward to that. We pray over prayer requests that come in on these cards every week when our staff gathers. And of course, members, you also can turn in a prayer request on that card. But we cannot do encouragement by filling out cards. Encouragement is a face-to-face -face business. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do this morning, whether you are a member or whether you are a guest, if you feel comfortable standing up, I want you to stand up if you would. And then I want you to find somebody that you have not spoken to already this morning, and I want you to encourage them in Jesus' name. Would you remain standing with us as we continue to worship, as we continue to proclaim the truth that the victory is his, that he has given us freedom, that we are his sons and daughters. Oh. 
2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, it says, now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. This verse essentially says that we are to behold, right? Beholding his glory and to behold is to become. As we behold or as we look and see the glory of the Lord and the beauty of the Lord, it begins to transform us. Later on in the passage, Paul goes on to say that that glory specifically is the glory of God in the face of Christ. This next song, come behold the wondrous mystery. Right, as we begin to see who he is in verse one, in the birth of Christ, in verse two, the life of Christ, it says, see the true and better Adam, the one who lived the life that we should have. Verse three, the death of Christ. Verse four, as we behold the resurrection of Christ, may it begin to transform us and change us to become more like him.
resurrected as we will be when he comes God, we are so thankful that we can stand here today and behold the glory and the beauty of who you are. God, we stand here today thankful and grateful for the life of Jesus, for the birth, the life, the death and the resurrection that allowed us to have this freedom, this connection with you, Lord. We thank you that you made a way when there was no way. So God, would you continue to transform us, to change us into the image of your son, Jesus? God, would we behold who you truly are? Would we not minimize and take light of how great you are? We love you, Lord. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ethan. Appreciate you, man. We continue this morning in our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. And the, uh, the specific section that we're in, a section which spanned, uh, is spanning several weeks. Uh, Paul has been since chapter 7 uh, responding to some things the, the church at Corinth asked him about. In chapter 7, verse 1, he says, about the things you wrote. And I don't know if they had, they had written to him regarding gifts of the Spirit or if he had just heard some things, probably some combination of that. But within that section, he now at, at chapter 12, verse 1, has introduced another, another section now about matters of the Spirit. And that becomes his theme in chapters 12, 13, and 14. Three chapters, I believe it's taking us five weeks to make, it, make our way through these three chapters. What was going on in the church at Corinth was that, that um, in, the, in the name of exercising the gifts of the Spirit, the church was further fanning up all kinds of unpleasant things. Envy and, uh, and, and self-aggrandizement, that is putting themselves forward as a big deal. And it was, it was rendering the worship of the church uh, fractured and chaotic uh, so much so that, that not, to, not to give away too much from a message that's still a couple of weeks out, but the ending of this section as chapter 14 ends is an appeal to the church for order in the life of the body of Christ. So the problem was, was chaos and all kinds of other just very unpleasant things going on. And so as he begins to explain in chapter 12 about gifts of the Spirit, He's made it clear that these gifts of the Spirit are, are given by God the Holy Spirit at the moment of one's salvation. When you're saved, you are given your spiritual gift. And your spiritual gift is given to you for the glory of God and the building up of the body of Christ, the church. And, and to, to feel otherwise is to, to veer into all kinds of, of unpleasant territory regarding your, your, again, your envying of one another and your, your failing to exercise your gift appropriately. And just like last week, we, we saw this word picture of the human body, how it is all interconnected and interdependent, though each of the parts is quite distinct, so it is to be in the body of Christ. And we've talked about the importance of knowing and exercising your spiritual gift. But there is a foundation. If, if spiritual gifts are the, the functioning of the body of Christ, that function 
stands on a foundation of love. Even more so than knowing and putting our spiritual gifts in impl in, into implementation. There's a value, love, that is to be the basis on which everything operates. In fact, <laughs> over the last couple of weeks, uh, Pastor David a couple of weeks ago and me last week, we've talked about the importance again of discovering your spiritual gift. And I believe it is the, the obligation of every believer to discover your spiritual gift so that you can be used of God in the way he's designed you to be used in the body of Christ. But if you're, and if, and if you're on a journey to learn your spiritual gift and you just aren't there yet, let me recommend, based on chapter 13, what we're about to talk our way through, one beginning point for you, love. Love. Make certain that you are moving in love as you move in the body of Christ. Let's define love and make sure we define it right. Because if we, if we make much of love as we're going to this morning and we have it defined wrong, then we'll, we'll not know what we're talking about. So let's make sure we have a good definition. I've given it to you on your outline there. Uh, love is an unconditional self-sacrificial commitment to the well-being of another. It is not just having an emotional soft spot for someone. Now that can be a part of it, and that's not bad. In a, in a casual way, if I'm not using the word in its most careful sense, I might say, I love my doggos. I have a couple of amazing dogs of which I am very, very fond. One is a yellow Beagle Lab mix. That is a Beaglador. His name is Gibson, and he is legendary. The other, is a 15 month old, all knees and elbows, huge gangly labradoodle. His name is Fender, Gibson and Fender, the two guitar companies. No coincidence in my family that that's how the dogs got named. At our house, yellow dog hair is both a condiment and a fashion accessory. <laughs> it just goes with everything, you know, that's, that's just life. And, but if you ask me in a serious, oh, Brother Russell, now do you really mean that you love your dogs? My response would be, of course not. Of course, I am not unconditionally committed to their well-being. I'm quite fond of them. Love is also not romantic impulse. Roman romance is a, a great part of life. I'm all for it. Gail and I are, are bearing down on our 34th wedding anniversary and we have been in love. And, and our love for one another is more profound than just romantic impulse, but it certainly includes romance. It's still fun to be married and I'm all for it, but that is not the definitional core of love. Again, the definitional core of love, what we're talking about when we talk about agape or agape, the highest form of love in the New Testament. An unconditional self-sacrificial commitment to the well-being of another. If you want to really know what that looks like, we're about to deal with a passage that's going to describe for us a lot about it. But if you want to see it illustrated, look to the cross. The best illustration of love the universe has ever seen is the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for sinners. Don't you ever believe that Roman spikes were sufficient to hold the omnipotent Son of God on a cross. Roman spikes did not hold him on that cross. His love for his Father and passion to be obedient held him on that cross, and his love for you and desire to see you redeemed held him on that cross for the redemption of his people. An unconditional, self-sacrificial commitment to the well-being of others. That's love. And 1 Corinthians 13 talks about love. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 finds its way to a whole lot of weddings. I see it printed on wedding programs all the time. I've even read it at weddings. I don't think it's jarringly out of place at weddings as long as we remember this chapter is not talking about husbands and wives it's talking about members of the same 
church. This is church membership love. 1 Corinthians 13 is a church covenant. It is the covenant Paul is prescribing for the church at Corinth. This is what it ought to look like to be a church member alongside somebody. Chapter 12 is about gifting in the church. Chapter 14 is about gifting in the church. He's not changing the subject. Chapter 13 is about love in the church. Having spoken in chapter 12 about love, he says at the very end of chapter 12, I wanna show you an even better way. That's my title this morning, Love the Even Better Way. Way. Roman numeral one, I'm going to be going through the passage and reading it as I walk through the outline. Roman numeral one, the priority of love. The priority of love. The first three verses, Paul is going to paint four different word pictures of the exercise of spiritual gifting in a spectacular, over-the-top way, not a realistic way. He's going, to, he's going to cite four different things and say, you know, if I have this, even to an ultimate degree that no one has ever seen. If I speak with human or angelic languages but do not have love, I'm a sounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor and give my body to be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. The priority of love, love, letter A, over ultimate speech, over ultimate speech. If I could speak so skillfully that when people hear me talk, they, they believe they're hearing an angel's rhetoric. Now let me chase a little footnote here. He is not saying there is some special language that angels speak. In fact, we know quite the opposite from Scripture. Multiple times in Scripture, angels appear to people and they speak the language those people understand. Multiple times in Scripture, we're given visions of heaven with the angels either speaking or singing. They are speaking and singing in languages the hearers speak or sing to understand. There is no hint in Scripture of some magical, different, angelic language, and that's not what Paul is doing here. He's using the over-the-top word picture of if my, if my rhetoric if my gift of teaching or my gift of prophecy is so good, when people hear me singing, they think, oh, he's just an angel. If I don't have love, I may as well just be banging on a cymbal. Second, over the top thing, love is more important than ultimate prophecy. He does it again with prophecy. He says, if my gift of prophecy is so good that I understand every single mystery and understand all knowledge, that is, if I'm so gifted, there is nothing left that I don't have figured out. Well, there aren't any of those either. But even if it were true, it wouldn't matter if I didn't have love. The third one, ultimate faith. If I had so much faith that I could literally push mountains around. Now, I know Jesus used this same figure of speech, and you can bet Paul knew that too. But he's, he's, Jesus used the figure of speech to say that if it's God's will for you to do things that seem impossible, you trust him and watch him work. Here Paul is saying, if I had so much faith that there was no such thing as earth moving equipment because I could just go do it. If that mountain needed to be 20 feet to the left, I could go move it because of my great faith. Nobody's ever done that. Nobody's ever had that kind of faith. It's one more over the top example. And he's saying, even if I had that kind of faith, if I don't have love, I'm nothing. And then ultimate sacrifice. If I give up every single thing I have, verse three, if I donate all my goods to feed the poor and even give my body to be burned, some translations have an alternate reading there, give my body in order to boast. I just don't think that's the best reading. If I give my body in order to be burned, and nobody in this room's ever done that. Nobody in this room has ever given up everything they've got for the sake of feeding the poor. Even if I had this, this ultimate giving, if I don't have love, I gain nothing. In, in summation, the priority of love, even if I have 
a spiritual gifting that is remarkable beyond anything anybody has ever seen. Remember, we're talking about a church that was ripping itself up over the bizarre practice and envy of, of different spiritual gifts. No matter how gifted I am, I'm a noisemaker, I am nothing, I gain nothing if love is not what's driving me, the priority of love. Roman numeral two, the practices of love. And I've said that on your outline, the practices of love, not the mere properties of love. Through this middle section, every single one of these descriptive words about love that we're about to get in these next verses, in the original language, they're not adjectives. Now, if you're, if you're not a grammarian at all, bear with those of us for a moment who, who kind of are. These aren't adjectives. Every single one of them is a verb. They sometimes are translated as adjectives to make the sentences read right in English, but these are, not, these are not descriptor words that describe love as though love is, is some sort of display case item kept safely under glass with a plaque that tells you what you're looking at. This is not that. Love does things or love does not do things. So this, this section is not just the properties of love, it's the practices of love. Some positive, some negative. Let's take a look. Letter A, the extension of love. Verse four, love is patient, love is kind. The extension of love, number one and two on your outline, patience and kindness. Patience, the New Testament has two commonly used words for patience. One of those words is endurance in rough circumstances. That's not the one that is used here. That kind of endurance in rough circumstances matters, but it's not at the heart of love. This word, patience, is dealing well with people that are making it difficult. And if we're gonna love each other, we're gonna need that. Um, boy, in the other services, when I said, if we're gonna love each other, we're gonna need a lot of patience, the people who know me best all said amen. Um, <laughs> the ones in the service who know me best are polite enough not to, but uh, look, the deal is, if we're gonna unconditionally, self-sacrificially look out for one another's well-being, and we are who we are, we're gonna need patience. Just goes with the territory. Patience and kindness. Kindness is the other side of the coin. Patience says, you know what? For you, I'll take it. For you, I'll take it. Kindness says, for you, I'll give it. I'll, I'll take whatever I have to take for the sake of love. I'll give whatever I have to give for the sake of love. Love extends itself, the extension of love. Roman, I mean, letter B, under the, the practices of love, the exclusions of love. Some things that love does not do or have. Some things that are not true about love. Um, the story is told, I, I don't believe it's true, but the story is told that, that when someone asked Michelangelo, uh, Michelangelo, who carved the, uh, some would argue, the world's most magnificent work of sculptural art is Michelangelo's David. It stands in the Academy in Florence, Italy, and it is a breathtaking, larger-than-life sculpture of a young King David. And uh, someone is supposed to have asked Michelangelo, how did you get from an enormous block of marble to that incredible statue? Michelangelo is supposed to have said, it wasn't all that hard. I, I took my block of granite and I knocked off everything that didn't look like David. <laughs> Done. I, I don't imagine Michelangelo would reduce his art to something so simple, but it's not a bad idea. These next eight properties knock off some things that aren't love on our way to, on our way to a better understanding and a better practice of love. Eight things that, that love does not do. Number one, envy. Envy. Love does not envy. Chapter, uh, or verse four, second part of the verse. Love does not envy. <laughs> how, do, how do you respond when somebody near your life, somebody maybe in the church with you, is blessed in a way you have not been blessed? Lord, I am reminded of your grace and goodness when I see how good you're being to that person. 
It is an amazing reminder to me that you're a good God, you're a kind God. And I, I, am, I am so thrilled to see them blessed because I know they don't deserve it. Okay, okay, theologically, not personally, okay? Theologically, you know they don't deserve it. Personally, on the other hand, if, you're, if your response is, okay, Lord, you better tell me why you're blessing them and not me. I don't like it when people who aren't me are blessed. That's envy, and it doesn't look like love. Knock it off. Knock it off. Envy and love are not compatible. You'll know you've beaten this one when you enjoy seeing God bless others. Envy. The other side of the coin of envy is number two, boastfulness. Love is not boastful, still in verse four. Boastfulness. You know what? Boastfulness is, is just envy viewed from a different angle. Envy says, I want what you have. Boastfulness says, you ought to want what I have. Other side of the same coin. Boastfulness is, yeah, how can, especially in the context of, of, of giftedness in the church, how can you boast about a gift? You didn't do anything to earn it. The living God gave it to you. What's to boast about? The third on our list, conceitedness. Love is not conceited. This is the internal attitude that drives that boasting. Love is not conceited. Verse four, love doesn't think of itself as a big deal. You will not function in an effective and healthy way in the body of Christ. And by the way, as I stand up front with these silly lights and the silly microphone and these silly gyrant screens, I won't function effectively in the body of Christ either if I think I'm a big deal. You won't, I won't, we won't. Love is not concerned with being a big deal. My very, very, very favorite biblical example of this is John the Baptist. If anybody could claim to be a big deal, Jesus himself said of John the Baptist, there's never been a man born of woman like John the Baptist. So excluding himself, Jesus' estimation of John the Baptist is that's the greatest man that was ever born. Woo, if Jesus said about that about me, I would have a lapel pin. Jesus is number one guy. I mean, what a resume line, right? I'm the greatest man that ever lived and the creator of all mankind said so. Away with you lesser beings. You know, you know what John the Baptist said? John the Baptist said, I've got to make certain I am continually becoming a smaller and smaller deal. I must decrease so that Jesus would increase. The greatest man that ever lived according to God the Son was not concerned with being a big deal. He was concerned with seeing to it that he was a small deal so that Jesus would be seen as the only big deal. That is love. Love is not conceited. Next on our list, rudeness. Love does not act improperly, verse five. It's just rudeness, it's just rudeness. Don't you raise somebody to get into a parking spot, here or anywhere else. Don't be rude. Don't fail to hold the door when somebody's trying to carry a bunch of stuff. Don't be rude. Don't be impolite, don't be pushy. Don't be rude. That's, a, that's simply what that means. Number five, self-seeking. Love is not selfish. It's just not selfish. Love doesn't have to have its own way. If I am unconditionally, self-sacrificially committed to your well-being, second only to the glory of God, I want God glorified and I want what's best for you. After those things are done, there's probably not a whole lot of room for me to care whether I get my own way. We ought to all together not care much whether we get our own way. It's just not that important. And it's incompatible with love to have to have your own way. Love is not self-seeking. Number six, love is not provoked. Or as I've said it on the outline, provocability. 
Now I'm told by the very, very smart ladies that proof this outline that according to Microsoft Office, provocability is not a word. As for me, I'm a huge, huge fan of Professor J.R.R. Tolkien, have been since I learned to read. Tolkien and I go way back. Tolkien was the department head of philology at Oxford University in England, where they published the Oxford Unabridged English Dictionary. Tolkien was the department head. Tolkien said, words have to come from somewhere. <laughs> so let it be known, as of September 8, 2019, in the worship center of the McGregor Baptist Church, thus is born the perfectly good word, provocability. And you already know what it means, the ability to be easily provoked. Words had to be born somewhere. I just did it. All right. Boy, the power. Um, <laughs> Watch that big deal stuff, Russell. Watch that big deal stuff. Um, you know people like this. In the morning when they wake up, they know they're going to be mad that day. And then they go looking for the reason, right? I know I'm upset, now let me just find out why. I mean, their whole life is like a dry tinder a uh, pile, and the first spark that comes along, whoosh. If you know the old Southern idiom, to pitch a fit, these are people whose whole life is a fit looking for a place to pitch, okay? That's incompatible with love. It should not be easy to stir you up for conflict. Not if you're driven by love. Provocability. And then number seven, scorekeeping. Scorekeeping. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. I want you to know I accept your apology. I really do. I'm, 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 you know, we're fine. I accept your apology. Now let me just make certain I never forget what you did to me. <laughs> no, you're forgiven. That's fine, right? Just don't ever do it again. If we, if we get in the business of keeping score regarding the wrongs we do, the times we, we butt heads, the times we don't see something the same way, the times we might get a little bit sideways with each other, if we all keep that score and keep that scoreboard running, there won't be any two of us that will even be decent friends over the long years together, let alone What'll happen to our atmosphere of love? What'll happen to our commitment to one another's well-being if we're keeping score every time a slight wrong is done? Now, there's grievous, unrepentant of sin. Church discipline exists to deal with that. He's talked about that a few chapters ago. This is talking about, ooh, I don't like the way he looked at me. All right. Love just doesn't do that. And I'm so glad that the one who has the capacity to have the most complete record of my wrongdoing has chosen to, to nail it to the cross and put instead the perfect track record of Jesus Christ in its place so that when I stand in judgment one day because of the gospel of Christ, and because he has called me to himself, because I have repented and turned from my sin and trusted him, I will not stand before a perfect judge who is maintaining a record of my wrongdoing. And he has forgiven me way more than I'll ever have to forgive you. Amen. Love doesn't keep the score. Finally, love doesn't take pleasure in sin. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, verse six. Well, I would never find joy in unrighteousness. Let me tell you, let me tell you what he did. Let me tell you what I heard. I think gossip is maybe the main way otherwise godly people get little joy out of little unrighteousnesses. Be very, very careful letting anybody's unrighteousness, yourself or anyone else's unrighteousness, be a source of entertainment for you, 
or be a source of joy for you. Love does not find joy in unrighteousness. And then let her see the endurance of love. Love rejoices in truth and bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. The rest of verse 6. Dropping the knots now, he goes back to make positive statements. Love rejoices when truth is well served. Love rejoices when the truth of God's word is playing its way out in somebody's life. Love rejoices in personal truth telling and the great love of truth. Love just finds its joy in truth, not wrongdoing, as the previous clause says. And then love is built to last. Oh, if I had 20 extra minutes, the, the, the word picture of this, this bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. Um, it's, it's the idea, um, some, of you have your, some of you have your fragile uh, cell phone in something like a, a, a big old bulky otter box or something like that, some sort of case that's designed, not if you just drop your cell phone in a parking lot, but if you hurl your cell phone off a cliff, you've got a box on your cell phone that's designed to take it. That's what this word picture is. These four words in conjunction picture that love is ruggedized. Love is not environmentally sensitive. Love is an off-road vehicle with big knobby tires. Love is designed to bounce through it and come out okay, even when the circumstances aren't good, even when the moment is difficult, even when the person is giving me a tough time. Love endures. That's the picture. And finally, Roman 3, the permanence of love. We've talked about the practices of love as well as the priority of love, now the permanence of love. Love never ends. The permanence of love, verse eight. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for languages, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. Same word as uh, prophecies. For we know in part, prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, that is that which is not partial, the partial will come to an end. Three times now he's used that word, will come to an end. It's exactly the same word, times three. It will, become, it will come to an end, it will come to an end, it will come to an end. It's actually passive voice in the original. It will be brought to a close. It will be brought to a close. It will be brought to a close. In fact, I've given you four principles that arise from this paragraph. Let me go ahead and start with number two. I don't like the order I put them in back when I gave this, so let me reverse number two and number one. Number two of the principles I gave you, the gifts of prophecy and knowledge, according to this text, will, will be brought to an end. When? When we have come to our completed state. He gives us the when in verses 11 and 12. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. That's an that's a illustration saying, hey, we all already know that there are different stages in which different things are useful differently. In fact, now we see indistinctly as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, he's just said, the partial are knowledge and prophecy, according to verse nine. I know in part, but then I, I mean, now we see indistinctly as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. What he's saying is when we get to our completed state, when we're face to face with Jesus, when we're citizens of heaven, the Lord will bring to an end the gift of prophecy and the gift of knowledge. We won't need them anymore. Prophecy is, is telling God's people what God wants them to hear from his word. Knowledge is the gift of understanding what God has said in his word. And, and eventually, when we are with him in heaven, he will bring those gifts to an end. He will be present among us. Number one of these four principles, the one I said first, the gift of languages will cease. I gave you a blank there. The gift of languages will cease. The other gifts are said to be brought to an end. Notice with languages, it's a different gift or a different word. The gift of languages, or as some translations would put it, tongues, will cease. This is a, this is a verb that, that if expanded, basically says this gift will cease on its own. This gift will cease on its own. Uh, the gift of languages in the New Testament is in all cases, 
translatable, understandable human language. Shows up four times in the unfolding of the first decades of the church in the book of Acts. It showed up on the day of Pentecost, Acts 10. When the gospel first broke through to the Samaritans, Acts 8. When the gospel made its first big move into the Gentile world in the house of Cornelius, Acts 10. And with the disciples of John the Baptist who were late in understanding the gospel at Ephesus in Acts 19, four times over 30 years. The church at Corinth was the only church that the apostle Paul ever wrote to that was practicing something that that church was calling the gift of languages. And Paul's going to deal with that in chapter 14 lovingly, but in a restrictive way, not an encouraging way. And he starts his conversation by saying here, the legitimate biblical gift of instantly learning a human language that I have never learned for the sake of the advance of the gospel, that will come to an end. I believe it did by the end of the first century. There's certainly no evidence of it through most of the intervening centuries of the church or anything that claimed to be it through most of the intervening centuries of the church. Now, by the way, I understand that there are people that I love very, very much who understand the gift of tongues differently than I do, and that's okay. An understanding can be a point of distinction and even a point of definition without being a point of division. I'm not looking to pick a fight with anybody. But the Word of God says the gift of languages will cease on its own, okay? So the gift of languages will cease, the gifts of prophecy and knowledge will be brought to an end, and at that time, faith and hope will also no longer be needed. When, I'm, when we are face to face with Jesus in heaven, we won't need faith and hope, right? What we have had faith for, we'll be living. What we have hoped for, we'll be seeing. Therefore, he's able to say in verse 13, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these, why? Why is the greatest of these love? Because it's the only one of the three designed to be forever. Faith and hope are not designed forever. Love is in heaven forever. We won't need faith, we won't need hope, we will have love because back to verse eight, love never ends. This whole paragraph is about things that end and the one thing that doesn't. Love never ends.